Hi guys, it's me Chazzer HD and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we are reviewing what happened yesterday at the Singapore Grand Prix of 2024. A race that predictably for me was not very exciting at all and that's why I ended up not doing a live stream yesterday covering the race because that was the race I was expecting with Lando Norris um, out in front and thankfully for him he broke that curse of not leading on the first lap despite being on pole and you know one day it was going to happen he was going to break that curse and he did it and he absolutely dominated the race and if it wasn't for the front wing damage he had Lando would have won the race by probably 35 or 40 seconds that McLaren was unbelievably quick compared to everybody else um again if you look at the pace of that mclaren compared to everyone else before that uh touch with the barriers that lando had which caused that uh front wing damage that mclaren never bothered you know replacing the front wing he was i mean he was a second a lap quicker than max in second and then compared to people in eighth and ninth he was like two and a half three seconds quicker it was unbelievable the amount of pace that McLaren had in the race. But we've seen uh, high aero tracks that that McLaren does have an incredible race pace. We saw it, of course, at Zandvoort a few weeks ago. But yeah, the race, I mean, we it was competitive. There were some battles going on, but it just wasn't that exciting in the end. Um there was a lot of holding station and waiting for later parts of the race to actually do their thing. And that's what made it pretty boring. But we'll go through the results, of course, of the Singapore Grand Prix. Lando Norris taking the victory by a massive margin. And obviously a uh, his third win of the season for Norris winning by... 20 or pretty much 21 seconds but that could have easily been double uh that gap between him and Verstappen again if there wasn't any front wing damage on that McLaren um Oscar Piastri third 41 seconds behind his teammate Lando in a class of his own and then George Russell fourth over a minute behind the McLaren Mercedes clearly at the moment not in any possible way can contend for race victories right now I think that's what Singapore Grand Prix taught us about them Charles Leclerc fifth he had a, a good comeback drive almost grabbed a uh, fourth place Lewis Hamilton sick disappointing race for him but it really wasn't his fault Carlos Sainz in seventh good comeback drive after a poor start Fernando Alonso 8th, good result for Aston Martin. Hulkenberg 9th, good result for Haas. And there's Sergio Perez in P10. Pretty poor race weekend for the Mexican. But let's quickly start with McLaren. Lando Norris, yeah, his pace was some of the most dominant pace we have seen in a Grand Prix since maybe Mercedes at times in 2014 or even Mercedes at times in 2020 you would maybe even go back to Sebastian Vettel maybe at times in 2013 or 2011 it was that dominant from Lando Norris he was on a different planet in that car and I think you know we have to give praise to Lando because you know he got pole it was a good pole position by a couple tenths of a second and then the race he did in terms of his pace was just incredible. But we do have to say that that McLaren car is unbelievably quick. Lando, of course, is a very, very quick driver. We know that. But that McLaren car in the race was just... It, it was literally on another planet of performance compared to any other car out there. It was quite scary actually how quick they were and if they can replicate that a few more times between now and the end of the season I don't know how you stop them in a race situation unless one of their drivers crashes out or they have a reliability issue talking of crashing out Lando Norris nearly did that at uh, what was it turn was it turn 15 that uh, right hander right before you come to the final DRS zone 
very lucky, very, very lucky he did not, um, you know, go in a bit quicker and deeper and ended up, you know, out of the race. Because if he had crashed out of the race, that would have been one of the biggest bottle jobs of all time. That would have been one of the biggest um, choke jobs, as I know Americans more like to call it, um, of all time. It would have been up there with Mika Hakkinen at Monza that time in 99, which was incredibly 25 years ago. Um, it, it, it would have been on that level. It was, again, he was very lucky that it didn't end up being anything serious because at that point when he did that he was 25 seconds clear of second place he was almost a pit stop clear so there was no reason for him to be pushing that hard on the brakes but yeah he got away with one and he was so quick in that car and the car was so quick that he was still lapping at times quicker in the second stint of the race with a front wing that was clearly damaged you could tell by just the drop off in pace compared to how Lando was going before he had that contact with the barrier that front wing definitely had some damage on it even though you couldn't visibly see it the lap times uh told the story I think on that one and yeah Lando was still at times lapping quicker so it would have been interesting given that there was no safety car in the race which was very surprising because uh i think uh, this grand prix in singapore the first ever singapore grand prix to not have a safety car lando could have ended up lapping almost the entire field he was that quick um in the race up until that contact with the barrier but yeah won the race brilliant job outscored max verstappen by seven points obviously daniel ricardo took the fastest lap in what is probably the final race of Ricardo's probably F1 career. Uh, we'll get on to that later on. But um, yeah, Philando did the best he could. Max ending up in second. Obviously, there's nothing he could do about that. Obviously, it would have been good if Oscar Piastri had done a better lap in Q3. And uh, if Oscar had actually done... The lap he did in Q2, the lap time he did in Q2, if he did that in Q3, he would have ended up on the front row and that would have took away a couple more points from Max Verstappen in the Singapore Grand Prix. But, you know, Lando did the best job he could, that's all we can ask of him and that's what we demand of him. And if he can continue to produce the best that he can, then he still has a pretty good chance of winning this championship. Uh, but we'll quickly touch on Oscar Piastri. Very disappointing, his lack of pace. You know, to end up 41 seconds behind your teammate with, you know, doing the same amount of pit stops is incredibly disappointing. Very, very disappointing. Um, and I know Piastri, Singapore is not one of his better tracks, but that is a very disappointing performance. But luckily for him... The McLaren car is really quick and he ended up on the podium. So good result for Piastri, but the drive itself, I mean, the two overtakes he did on the two Mercedes drivers, again, brilliant overtaking, but the performance he had was nowhere near good enough. Um, really, given how quick McLaren were, it should have been a McLaren 1-2 in that race, but Piastri didn't deliver in qualifying. And then, of course, in the race, um, because of where he was, had to manage his tyres and then obviously got was, uh, you know, held up a bit behind Russell. And then that meant, obviously, he dropped loads and loads and loads of time to his teammates. So qualifying is where that issue began for him and it never seemed to get better. But Piastri has actually gained on Leclerc in the championship. So, I mean, that's at least a good thing there for Oscar and yet another podium for him as well. But McLaren continue to pull away on the Constructors. They're going to win the Constructors Championship, we know that. But on the driver's side, Lando, again, he's got a pretty good chance at winning this championship. He just needs to keep up the performance level we saw in Singapore. And if he does that, then... It's going to be close at the end of the season, but Lando definitely has a good chance of taking his first ever Drivers' World Championship. Let's go on, though, to Red Bull Racing, and we'll be quick with Red Bull because there wasn't really much that happened in their race. 
Max qualified second, finished in second. He did the job he needed to do. Prevented Lando from taking um, a load of points or a load more points out of him than, say, uh, Lando had been taking out of him in other races. Sergio Perez, really poor weekend from him. But for Verstappen, he did the best he could. You can't argue against what Max did in Singapore. He did the absolute best job he could possibly do. There was no way he was going to out-qualify Lando in qualifying. And honestly, even if he had got ahead of Lando to turn one, I don't see how Max could have kept Lando behind, given how unbelievably quick Lando in that McLaren was. It would have been similar to Zandvoort, where Lando eventually would have passed Max on track or something, because the pace difference was just unbelievable. So, yeah, Verstappen did the best job he can. And because his mate at uh, Racing Bulls, Daniel Ricciardo, took the fastest lap at the very end of the race, for the final six races of the season, Max Verstappen, including the sprint races we have, all he has to do is finish second in every race and sprint race, and he will be world champion. So that's a positive for Max, that he doesn't have to officially win any more races. Of course, he really wants to and really needs to, to you know make the end of the season a bit more comfortable for him. But Red Bull, I believe, have an upgrade coming at the next Grand Prix in four weeks' time in Austin. If that upgrade works and it gives them an extra, say say half a second a lap especially around a track like the circuit of americas then that should be enough for max verstappen to win the championship because i don't think mclaren have got any more big upgrades in the pipeline that could you know that they could bring to the track that that, that could enable to mclaren to stretch their legs even further ahead of the field so if that upgrade for red bull does work and they do gain say what ferrari have gained from their upgrade at monza recently then again i think max verstappen wins the championship because even though mclaren are very quick right now max verstappen in these last eight nine races we've seen Max Verstappen has clearly been performing better than Lando Norris. There is no doubt about that. So all Max needs is a car that is not even necessarily quicker than the McLaren. If it's around about the same pace as the McLaren, that's all he needs really. Because we know that Max is better than Lando Norris. That is not even up for debate as far as I'm concerned. So... As long as he has a car around about as quick, then Max will, I think, easily be able to win his fourth championship. So for Red Bull, in terms of winning the driver's title, it all comes down to that upgrade. And again, if it does work fully, like Ferrari had with their upgrade a, a few weeks ago, then Max Verstappen will be world champion. But if it doesn't work, and you have to say, a, a lot of the last few upgrades Red Bull have brought haven't worked, so it's not a guarantee that it will work. If it doesn't work, then they're going to have to hope for not miracles, but hope that Lando continues to make mistakes on race day that costs him a few points here and a few points there. So we'll see what happens with that upgrade package in Austin. Um... Let's go on next to... I'm going to go on to Ferrari next. Because I think they were the more competitive team than Mercedes in um, in the race weekend. And it was such a shame what happened in qualifying. Leclerc did a really poor lap at Q3 and also went over the white line somewhere, which got his lap time deleted. And obviously Carlos Sainz crashed in Q3. Ninth and 10th they were on the grid. And to be fair, they did a really good job of rescuing a pretty good result considering not just where they started, but if you look at the first 20, 30 laps of the race, they were going nowhere. They were stuck in traffic and they were just in a horrible situation of losing multiple seconds per lap to the people that, you know, the people ahead that they were supposed to be racing. Uh, but once they got into clear air, that Ferrari car was properly quick. And I still maintain that they were the second quickest team in Singapore. 
if Leclerc had done the best lap he possibly could have in Q3, I think Leclerc would have been on the front row, and I don't think Leclerc would have been as slow compared to Norris as Max was. Lando still would have won, because Ferrari, you know, still weren't on that type of pace, but Ferrari definitely could have been on the podium. There is no doubt about that. And I mean, just look at the pace Leclerc had on fresh tyres compared to the Mercedes drivers in the second half of the race. He was able to catch and pass Lewis Hamilton and then ended up over 20 seconds ahead of him by the end of the race and then almost passed George Russell for fourth. Just shows you how much quicker Ferrari were than Mercedes in Singapore. So the pace was great. They just messed their weekend up with what happened in Q3, which was a shame. But I hope Ferrari don't get too downbeat because the car clearly has a lot of pace. And at the next Grand Prix in Austin, there's no reason why Ferrari can't be right up there fighting for pole or, you know, right up there in the podium positions and maybe fighting for a race win. You don't know at the next Grand Prix in Austin. Still plenty more up for grabs for Ferrari this season, even though they're not going to be winning the World Championship. Um, and let's go on to Mercedes-Benz. The final team we'll go on to. What we saw in Singapore in the race was clear evidence that Mercedes-Benz, I'd say for the rest of the season, they can't fight for race wins anymore. No way. To end up a minute off the race win at a track that really showcases how good your car is aerodynamically and chassis wise Mercedes were absolutely miles off the pace and they were lucky that Norris had his front wing damage because they could have ended up being lapped with both cars I mean Lewis Hamilton definitely would have been lapped if Lando didn't have that damage and Russell easily could have as well that is how slow they were in Singapore and like I said, they are no longer race win contenders until they bring an upgrade. I don't know if they're going to. If they're not going to, then yeah, they are not race win contenders anymore. I can see them contending for a podium here and there, depending on the race weekend and what track we're at. But absolutely no chance are they winning another race because they don't have the pace. They are nowhere near the pace of McLaren. They're not as quick as Ferrari are at all. And with Red Bull and Verstappen, as long as Red Bull get the setup right, you feel as though they are also a bit quicker than Mercedes right now. So yeah, Mercedes almost going back to where they were at the start of the season with their pace compared to the absolute front runners. Um, for George Russell, he did the best he could. I thought for a while he was going to finish on the podium, but then Oscar Piastri, the McLaren, just had so much more pace than him. And ended up uh, overtaking him with a brilliant move. And ended up 20 seconds ahead of him by the end of the race. Just shows you how quick that McLaren is compared to the Mercedes. Uh, given that Piastri, you know, had to come from quite a few seconds back to overtake Russell. And then, you know, build that 20 second gap. So, yeah, Russell, you know, he did well to hold off Leclerc in the end. Because I really thought Leclerc would pass Russell. But, yeah, Russell did a great job to hold on to fourth place. Good result for him and the best result, realistically, he could have got from that race. But for Lewis Hamilton, I know in Baku I said, oh, you know, Mercedes may have made their fuck-ups, but, you know, Hamilton has a lot of blame that he needs to take on himself. That is not the case here in Singapore. Why on earth did Mercedes think it would be a good decision to split their strategy on the grid? And put Lewis Hamilton and start him on the soft compound tyre. If you look at all the years past we've had here in Singapore. People rarely start the Singapore Grand Prix on the softest compound. Unless they have to. Unless they're mandated to. So why on earth did they start on the soft compound tyre? They knew that compound was going to wear pretty quickly. And it did. And Hamilton had to pit quite early compared to all the rivals around him. And that's why he was so slow in the second half of the race once Piastri, Leclerc, Russell, Verstappen had all pitted. So I, I just don't get why Mercedes did that. Because 
you know, when you split strategy on the grid, normally you will do that if you're either a midfield team outside of the top 10 or if you're a front-running team but both cars are low down on the grid and out of position, then again, you'll, you know, uh, split your strategy to just try and see what strategy will work and try and, you know, uh, take a gamble to get yourself up the grid. Mercedes were third and fourth on the grid. There was no need to gamble. So why on earth did they split their strategy? I've also noticed with Mercedes, they do tend to split their strategy a lot with who starts on what tyres. Why? It's not necessary at every Grand Prix. Again, if one of your drivers is out of position, I get it. Or both drivers are out of position, I get it. But you were third and fourth on the grid. You were in a much better grid position than really you deserve to be in. Because Piastri probably should have been ahead of you. And then obviously what happened to Ferrari happened. So, I, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And they absolutely screwed over Lewis Hamilton's race. Because Hamilton's pace on a soft compound time was actually pretty good. He was only... But when he pitted, he was like 8 or 9 seconds behind Verstappen on a tyre that was wearing out quicker and was a couple seconds ahead of Russell. I think Russell was uh, backing off, though, to manage his tyres for later in the race. But still, the pace was good, but Lewis was always going to have to pit earlier on those tyres that were wearing quicker, and that ultimately screwed him over. Like I said, when he pitted, he was like 8 or maybe 10 seconds behind Verstappen, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you look at the end of the race, Max Verstappen finished a minute ahead. One minute ahead of Lewis Hamilton. And that's all because Max pitted later and had fresher tyres than Lewis. So you can't sit there and go, oh, Lewis Hamilton was terrible. No, Mercedes were terrible. Why on earth did you give him that strategy? When I, when I, because I didn't obviously stream for the race, I woke up literally right before the race and I saw Hamilton starting on soft tyre. I was like, why? Like, yeah, maybe you'll get a position off the line and they almost did. But even if you do that, it's not worth it because the tyre wear will force you to pit way earlier and it will just compromise your race massively. But, I mean, the only thing I could say about Mercedes that would maybe be, be a bit more fair towards them is maybe they were expecting a safety car and obviously we didn't get one at all which was a massive surprise but maybe they were expecting one which would have bailed Lewis Hamilton out but even if there was a safety car I still think it would have hurt Lewis Hamilton's race unless there was a safety car that came out right as Hamilton was about to pit because let's say if a safety car came out on lap 10 and Hamilton decided to get rid of the soft tyres then, that still would have compromised his race because he would have gone back into traffic and then would have had to overtake a load of slower cars. And then by the time he got past those cars, his tyres would have been a bit more worn than they should have been. And then F1 else ahead would then pit and have much fresher tyres for the end of the race. So that strategy that they put him on was always going to be very difficult to succeed if you know what I mean the chances of that strategy working was like 10% max so yeah Lewis Hamilton was screwed over in Singapore no doubt about it he was not given the opportunity the means to have a a good race Mercedes screwed him over horrible strategy and again Please, unless both cars are low down on the grid, stop splitting the strategy. It's not worth it. You're, you know, you're a serious racing team. You're not, you know, I don't think Mercedes are always in the position where they need to split their race strategy. So, yeah. Just a stupid decision by Mercedes-Benz. Uh, but those are the top teams. Uh, congrats to Alonso and Hulkenberg for finishing the points. Hulkenberg especially, great job. He was running up in sixth place for a while. Obviously got undercut by Alonso. And Hulkenberg was close to Alonso at the end, but he just didn't have enough time, I think, to get the move done. 
Uh, Franco Colapinto, another shout out for him. What a start he had. Dive bomb down the inside. No, a couple drivers, including his teammate, complained about it. But so what? The gap was there. He made the move. And it was all well and fair. So fuck what the others have to think. And one final thing I have to get into is, of course, Daniel Ricciardo. Looks like it's his final F1 race. Um, unless Sergio Perez has a really shocking end to the season, I'd be surprised, honestly, if Ricardo was in that Red Bull next year. So if this is the end for Ricardo, then <sighs> it, it is a shame because there has been some races this season where I think Ricardo has performed very well and hasn't quite got as much credit for it as he's deserved. I mean, if you go back to the Canadian Grand Prix weekend, for example, qualified fifth and was only like a tenth and a half of pole position. Um, finished in eighth in that race as well. Or he had a very good sprint race in Miami. Finishing in fourth. Had a few other points finishes as well. He showed some potential, but it just wasn't consistent enough. But in summary, for his career... He had a, he's had a fantastic Formula 1 career. I will probably at some point do a video about Daniel Ricciardo's career. But people might find this controversial. I don't care. But if you look at, you know, between the years of 2014 and the end of 2020, Daniel Ricciardo was probably one of the top five drivers on the grid. The only drivers I could put ahead of him between that you know, between those years was what? Lewis Hamilton, obviously, Sebastian Vettel, um, Max Verstappen, you could, you know, put ahead. Um, and in terms of others, again, you would have to, you'd have to present your arguments for that. I don't think you could put Charles Leclerc ahead of Ricardo during that era because Leclerc was only on the grid from 2018 to 2020, and I think what Ricardo did in that era surpassed what Leclerc did. So, yeah, I'd say during that 2014 to 2020 era, Ricardo was probably at least the fourth best driver during that era. And when he was at Red Bull, the best team he was at, where he won, you know, a load of races... Sadly for him, he was at that team at the wrong place at the wrong time. If Red Bull during that time were right up there and as quick as Mercedes-Benz and were able to win the championship, Daniel Ricciardo, I think, could have won at least one championship. Because during that era, he was, without a doubt, one of the best drivers on the grid. There is no doubt about that. People could argue about, you know, whatever they want, you know, when it comes to those particular eras. But Daniel Ricciardo, when he was at his best... And I'm talking 2014, 2016, 2017, 2018 to a degree, 2020. When he was at his best, he was one of the best on the grid, without a doubt. And I will not have disrespect towards Daniel Ricciardo's name. If people want to call him Ricciardo Slow now, that's fine, because, you know, he's clearly past his prime. But when he was at his best... And we all know it, he was one of the best in the world. No doubt about that. And I hope that his motorsport career isn't over. Because I think he can have success in other series. If he does decide to go to America and IndyCar, I wouldn't be surprised if he maybe is able to, you know, win some races over there. Maybe contend for a championship. Obviously, if he was able to go over there and win the uh, Indy 500, that would be incredible. Also, you've got the World Endurance Championship. There's no reason why teams wouldn't want to have Ricardo on board over there. So, we'll see what Ricardo does. I hope this is not the end of his motorsport career because I still think he has a lot to give. He is still, if you compare him to drivers in other series, he's still at a very high level. He just isn't at the level he was at previously. So, yeah, sad to see Ricardo go, but I mean, we thought he was gone last year, didn't we? Uh, didn't we? And then surprisingly came back. So, yeah, what a career it's been. And like I said, with when he was at Red Bull, wrong place, wrong time. If he was there at the right place, and and it was all you know the right time and all. Like I said, 
he could have been a world champion. He really could have been. But guys, that is it for this podcast episode reviewing the Singapore Grand Prix. The next podcast episode, of course, is not going to be for a few weeks because the next Grand Prix in Austin is in four weeks' time. So that will be the uh, next recording of the podcast and episode, of course. Uh, Just to update you guys quickly again after what I said on Saturday with my qualifying watch along. I do have at least one video planned for this break in between the Singapore and US Grand Prix. And I will try to get that out. Maybe next week or the week after. We'll see exactly when it comes out. Ideally, I'd like it to come out in, say, 10 days from now. That would be good if I could do that. Um, And then maybe if I've got enough time, I can get another video out as well. But we'll have to see on that. But definitely one video in the pipeline um, that I'm working on to come out in this little break we have. Um, So we'll see when that comes out. I'll let you guys know, of course, when I know if it's, you know, uh, in terms of when it's going to come out. And obviously I'll let you know what it's about as well. But thank you guys for coming along for this podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you are new to the channel for more episodes like this. Make sure to smash the like button before you go. It does help the channel grow, of course here on youtube and until guys my next podcast for the u.s grand prix in a few weeks time it has been me chaser hd goodbye